Everybody say undeterred. undeterred. Now this is both a leadership and a honoring God message. This message hopefully will challenge us all. And I want you to, to hear me today. Of course, to deter is to discourage. To discourage a person, a group, or even a nation from doing something by instilling upon that person, group, or a nation fear, anxiety, or doubt. We see groups today in our country as never before that have set out to deter, to interrupt the process. George Soros, with his billions, are uh, paying. Um, they're not protesters. Uh, these are hooligans. These are anarchists. You never protest by damaging someone else's property. There's no constitutional protection afforded to someone to pick up a stone and throw it through that window in the name of, I disagree with what that man said, so I am going to trash his possessions or a college campus or I'm going to overturn cars. I'm going to stand in the street and block the flow of traffic. My friends, that, that is not protesting. We members here at the upper room, we know something about protesting because we protest every Saturday. We go to an abortion clinic and we stand where we can lawfully stand. We cannot lawfully block the street. We cannot lawfully go into that clinic. We cannot lawfully go uh, walk into their front yard. We cannot lawfully stand in their parking lot. And wherever the lawful boundaries are, that is where we collect. And that is where we, we stage a peaceful, nonviolent protest. We try to get the attention of that young lady and that young man while on their way into that clinic to stop a beating heart. We try to get their attention and change their minds. That's protest. I know how to protest. I know what it's like to see seven and eight police cars pull up, but no one can arrest us because we have our papers and we stand where we're permitted to stand. That's legal protest. If we picked up a rock, and threw it in the window of that abortion clinic, we would be wrong and would be in violation of the law. If we took our fist and struck one of the escorts who work there, even though they violate the rules and get all in our face, you can almost feel the spittle from their mouth. 
when they are talking. They take umbrellas and put umbrellas in our faces. Women have bent over and back their rear ends toward us. On the protest line. But had she, while she was doing that, had I kicked her, I would have been in violation of the law. But I must say, it crossed my mind. It really did. If you think that you're going to get what the Lord has for you without resistance, you're wrong. Amen. If you think that Satan is not going to try to intimidate you, if you think that Satan is not going to try and deter you, and he will try to use instruments of like fear, the fear of failure, the fear of sickness, the fear of what people may say, the fear of harm, fear, or anxiety, worry, doubt question your abilities or whatever tools that may be at his disposal. He's going to use every one of them to try and stop you. Allow me to say this, that once the will of the Lord is made known, one must be undeterred. Paul would not be persuaded to counsel his plans to go to, to Jerusalem. Let's look at this. Nothing, saints, today honors the Lord like obedience. Nothing. The timeless words of Solomon, uh, Samuel, excuse me, comes to mind. In 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 22, you find these words. Half the Lord as delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice. And to hearken, to listen to him than the fat of rams. Nothing takes the place of obedience. We honor the Lord when we obey him. Our honoring the Lord can be measured by our obedience. If you're not walking in obedience, you're not honoring God. Amen. It's not possible to honor him by doing something that he says not to do. Amen. If the Lord says wait and you do not wait, even if you do something that you think the Lord would have you to do, you're not honoring God until you do what he says. Now, in terms of leadership, a leader must be resolute. A leader must be firm and determined. You, you know, society is producing weaklings. And uh, it's, it's so in vogue now to be weak that when we see strength, we misinterpret strength as arrogance. Amen. We think a strong man now uh, is a racist. To have the courage of your convictions and to be the type of man who won't take down, in today's world, you're called a bully. That's because what had been projected before us for so long has been weakness. There are very few ambassadors now. Everybody now are diplomats. All we do is quid pro quo. We dumb down. We make deals. We 
keep, we keep redrawing the lines. When was the last time you seen someone stand for what they believe in and just keep standing? No matter what people or the devil says. And then instead of taking it back, double down. And add something to it. Now, the world doesn't like it when you do that. People have problems with people who stand their ground. Some resent me because I believe God and I believe the Bible and I, and I don't apologize for it. Oh, wouldn't, wouldn't is arrogant. Oh, wouldn't, you know, he thinks he knows everything. I know that I don't know everything. There's nothing about me to be arrogant about. But, I, but I'll tell you what, I'm confident in this. I know that my Redeemer liveth. And I know that the Bible is right. I know that. Seems to me the world can have conviction. And they are applauded. But the preacher and the church is told to stand down. The Human Commission, Roy Cooper, and half the state are still trying to overthrow common sense legislation. They don't get tired. If I could talk to them, I would ask, why do you want men to have access to the women's bathroom? What is the upside to that in society? And ladies, why aren't you appalled? I have a wife. I have an 81 year old mother. I have a daughter. And I have a church full of wonderful women and little girls. Patrick Wooden will never be for a man having access to the bathrooms with you ever, 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 ever. I think more of you than that. And I think nothing of any politician or anyone else who don't appreciate our women to that degree. Coach, something happened to men along the way. Men used to be natural protectors of women. Now we see grown men arguing for transgender, arguing for a man. He's standing there swinging just like you are, but the difference is he's got a dress and a wig on, and he thinks he's a woman, and you're arguing for him to have the right I don't care what the uh, ACC, NBA, ACLU, Krzyzewski, and any of the rest of them say, you are, are of infinitely more value to me than that and to God than that. And let me say this while I'm preaching. See, you, when you hear me say this stuff, because some of you are not spiritual, what you hear is my going political. That's not what I call myself doing. What I'm doing, that's not the politician in me, because I'm not a politician. That's the prophet. The prophet stands, and the prophet speaks truth to power in the name of the Lord. Jeremiah did it. Isaiah did it. Daniel did it. Praise God. Moses did it. All prophets do it. Of the 39 books in the Old Testament, 37 of the 39 is written about two or the actions of politicians. And we're supposed to let people mess us up to accommodate some messed up folk. Right. 
A leader must be firm and determined. Once the course of action or the action plan has been put in place, the leader must be undeterred. The great prayer or the great action plan, prayer and action plan of David at Ziglag comes to mind. After David's wives were taken, Ziglag was invaded. And all of David's men were hurt, and they even thought to stone him. The Bible says he encouraged himself in the Lord. Every leader has to know how to encourage yourself because if you lose that ability, you're dead because there comes a time when if you don't encourage yourself, you don't get any encouragement. David, after encouraging himself, here's what he did in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 8. And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? And shall I overtake them? And he, the Lord, answered him, David, God said, Pursue for thou shalt surely overtake them and without fail recover all. God said that. Gave him an action plan and told him what the outcome would be and said, go after them for you will without fail recover all. First Samuel chapter 30 verse 18 says, and David recovered all. Samuel chapter uh, 30 verse 19 the last clause says David recovered all but he, he would not have recovered all had he not stuck to the plane had he not remained undeterred had he not pursued the plane are you with me in these examples we see honoring God and what can be accomplished when a leader is undeterred? I hear the words of the mighty master builder, Nehemiah. You know, he built the wall. He said to a bunch of governors and political leaders who owned the area and had clout and power, Sam Ballad, Tobiah, Chesham, powerful leaders who tried to deter him. He said, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? Nehemiah 6 and 3. You got to know that what you're doing is worthwhile. You got to know that what you're doing is a great work. And you got to, you can't allow the enemy to distract you from the work that God has called you to. A good example of what happens when you get distracted can be found in 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 39 through 40. And I'll preach in just a minute. 40, uh, 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 39 and 40 says, And as the king passed by, he cried unto the king and said, And he said, Thy servant went out into the midst of of uh, the battle and behold a man turned aside and brought a man unto me and said keep this man if by any means he old English here be missing then shall thy life be for his life or else thou shalt pay a talent of silver look at this verse 40 speaking of himself and as thy servant was busy, 
Here and there, he was gone. He got distracted and got busy doing other things. And the man that he was assigned to keep got away. Don't let the enemy cause you to be distracted and have you busy here and there. And then the plan of God, the work of God, the things that the Lord has for you to do, those things get away. Satan will always try to pull you off track. Isn't that something to think about? Are you with me? Now let's look at Paul for a moment and his relationship to Jerusalem. Paul's relationship with Jerusalem was not necessarily Jerusalem proper. It wasn't necessarily the city of Jerusalem. It was the church. At Jerusalem. Now he loved Jerusalem. All Jews loved Jerusalem. But it was the church at Jerusalem that the apostle had such an aff affinity uh, to. And one of the reasons he wanted to go to Jerusalem on this particular leg of his third missionary journey was what he did to Jerusalem. Are you listening to me? If you turn to Acts of the Apostles, verse 1 through 3, you'll see something. The Bible says, and Saul, this was Paul before he got converted, his name was Saul, and Saul was consenting unto his death. This is the death of Stephen. They killed Stephen, calling on the Lord, and Saul was behind it. And at, and at that time, there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. This was the headquarters. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So persecution broke out. The saints began to run. The apostles remained in Jerusalem at the church in Jerusalem and devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made a great lamentation over him. Here's what was happening. For as for Saul, he made havoc of the church. Entering into every house and hauling men and women committed them to prison. Paul went crazy. Saul went mad. He hated Christianity with a passion. John Phillips in his book Exploring Acts wrote this about Paul and Saul what he, and what he did to the church. It says, Saul now went mad. He tells us so himself in, in later years. He, quote, made havoc of the church, end of quote. The expression is used of the ravages, ravages of a wild boar. Vision in your mind a wild boar hog ripping it's prey apart. This man lost his mind and attacked the church and went in and out of houses, grabbing men and women and throwing them in prison. It is recorded how he uh, would take some of the Christians and tie them to the back of wagons and drag them down cobblestone streets. And as the believers were being dragged to their death, it was a horrible way to die, skin and stuff being ripped off of them as they, they were being drugged by this man. He had his hit list 
Philip tells us. He entered into every house where a believer lived. And there was hardly a home where his cruelty had not been felt. The prisons overflowed. In, in later years, we find Paul, wherever his gospel travels took him, zealously taking up collections for the poor saints which were at Jerusalem. Many of them he had made poor. Their faces haunted him. Whenever he met with the Jerusalem church, he would see a he would see bereaved saints. He would see a husband missing here, a brother, a father missing there. The fruits of his furious persecution of the church in his unregenerated days when he would visit. There would be an empty chair on the choir stand, an empty place in the pew. He caused it. And it haunted him. Now, are you listening to me? It, 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 it haunted him. And uh, there is something positive to be said about what he went through and how it affected him. Because I'm always concerned about people who can do damage to other people, that doesn't bother them. They just simply say, hey, that was then, I'm forgiven, I'm done with it. I think that, I know this, Jesus forgives. Jesus sets free. But when you've harmed somebody, Amen. You can't just become cavalier about it. Praise the Lord. Uh, matter of fact, if there's a way to kind of make amends, something in you ought to say, I'll at least try. What Paul did in Jerusalem stayed with him. When he wrote to the saints at Corinth, 1 Corinthians 15 and 9. For I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle. Why are you the least? Why aren't you even fit to be called an apostle, Paul? He says, because I persecuted the church of God. Thank you for watching God First with Bishop Patrick L. Wooden Sr. and the Upper Room Church of God in Christ. To experience this message in its entirety, call 877-463-3477 to purchase a DVD or CD. God First will return next week at the same time. Until then, make every day a God First day. God First.